Hey everybody, Pastor Steven Anderson here from Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. And today I just wanted to make a short video warning you about this major false teacher, David Cloud. And uh, some of you might have heard of this guy, David Cloud, or his website, wayoflife.org. But the reason why this guy's website is so popular is because back 20 years ago, you know, it was one of the only independent Baptist websites on the internet. So that caused a lot of people to know about it because back then there was almost nothing on the internet that was independent Baptist. So this guy got in with a lot of people and he's always been one who has been pushing this false repent of your sins salvation where uh, faith isn't enough, believing's not enough, but you have to basically make Jesus the Lord of your life. And he claims that he doesn't teach lordship salvation, but over and over again he says you have to repent of your sins to be saved and you have to give him the authority in your life. But anyway, somebody just sent me an article from this guy uh, about the Jews. And I just want to read this to you because it's just so bizarre what he says in this article. And not only that, I just spoke to somebody who visited our church on Sunday and they said that David Cloud is on tour right now, you know, going from church to church teaching all this crazy Zionist, pro-Israel, pro-Jewish type doctrine. So anyway, I'm going to read this article that he just did called Napoleon's Attempt to Destroy the Jews. Now, right away, the title of this article seems pretty weird since Napoleon is known as one who liberated the Jews and, and gave the Jews all kinds of rights and freedoms that they had not previously had. And he even brings that up in this article. But according to David Cloud, you know, Napoleon attempted to destroy the Jews. So let's read this article together. I'll start at the beginning. Bible faith is not blind religious faith. It is faith based on the word of a God who cannot lie. And that word is authenticated by many infallible proofs. Israel's history, continued existence, return to the land, geography, and archaeology are among the chief of these. So notice what he's saying here that we don't just blindly believe in the Bible. I mean, the reason that we believe in the Bible is because of all this infallible proof, like Israel's history, their continued existence, their return to the land, their geography. That's all supposedly irrefutable proof for the God of the Bible. Well, why don't you just become a Jew then, David Cloud, if that's the reason why you believe the Bible is because of the persistence of this false religion, Judaism, and these people who cling to it. But... The sad thing is that the verse that he's quoting many infallible proofs is Acts chapter 1 verse 3, which he even puts in parentheses. If you actually look up that verse, you'll realize that it's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, that's what our belief is supposed to be based on, the resurrection of Christ, which is something that his precious Jews don't believe in. So the Jews reject the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ but then he takes a verse about the resurrection, infallible proofs, and he says, yeah, the Christ rejecting Jews and their wonderful history is our proof that the Bible is true. I mean, what a twisting and corrupting of scripture, just in the first paragraph. Here's the second paragraph. The survival of the Jews is unique in history. Never before has a nation been scattered throughout the world for two millennia and survived with their religion and language intact to return to their native land. Now, first of all, why is he celebrating the fact that they've kept their religion intact? Wouldn't it have been better if their false religion had gone away and they would have, say, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior? Why would it be wonderful that a Christ-rejecting, Christ-hating religion like Judaism, which denies that Jesus is the Messiah, would have been allowed to survive by providence? Why? It's, it's a bad religion. Does David Cloud think that Judaism is good? Uh, but then the other part of it is just simply a lie. The fact that they survive with their language intact, that is a lie. Hebrew became a dead language around AD 100 and was not resurrected as a living language again until 1882. That is a historical fact that the first native Hebrew speaker in the modern era, was born in the year 1882. He was raised by his parents in seclusion so that he would only hear Hebrew from his parents and they had a, a caretaker there that would speak Hebrew to him, the nanny. And then after that, there was a movement 
where the Jews would put their children in schools where they would be taught Hebrew from a young age so that they could grow up as native Hebrew speakers. Before 1882, there was not even one native Hebrew speaker on this planet. Now, people will sit there and say, well, no, it wasn't a dead language because the rabbis spoke Hebrew. Yeah, but that's not a native speaker. And that doesn't make it a living language. You see, there are people today who speak Latin, but Latin is still a dead language. There are no Latin speakers, but Latin is a dead language. Just because scholars learn Latin or Catholic priests might speak in Latin, that does not make them native Latin speakers, or it doesn't make Latin a living language, okay? Latin is a dead language. And Hebrew was a dead language until the late 1800s, early 1900s, when the Zionist movement began to try to bring the Jews back to uh, the so-called Holy Land. So that is just a lie that their language was intact. No, their language had been dead for almost 2,000 years. And obviously, yeah, you can resurrect it because you've got the Bible there to, to give you the vocabulary. And then the, the gentleman who raised his child in seclusion, Ben Yehuda, he actually... Uh, you know, made up a lot of the modern Hebrew words and created a modern uh, Hebrew dictionary and created the language of modern Hebrew and so on and so forth. Let's keep reading. When Frederick the Great, the atheist king of Prussia, asked, can you give me one single irrefut irrefutable proof of God? Jean-Baptiste de Boyer replied, yes, your majesty, the Jews. So again, the Jews are the reason why we believe the Bible because God is blessing the Jews and brought them back to the land. You know, what a bunch of garbage. You know, the reason I believe the Bible is because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Here's one irrefutable proof of God, the word of God, the Bible, the power. You know, I would point to Psalm 23, 1 Corinthians 13, John 14. You know, the word itself is the evidence because the word is so powerful that it could not be written by man. It's only written by God. But they'll point to the history of the Jews. That proves that God is real. Again, it almost seems like these people are Jews or something by, by the way that they, that they write. It's like that's what it's all about for them. But anyway, let me keep reading. In 1754, Bishop Thomas Newton wrote of the Jews, Their preservation is really one of the most illustrious acts of divine providence. They are dispersed among all nations, yet not confounded with any. Now, confounded with any means confused with any. See, he's saying they've been dispersed among all nations and have not become mixed with any. They haven't been confounded or convoluted or confused with any. Well, that's funny because I just took a flight into Newark, New Jersey, and about half the people on the airplane were Jews. And literally, there were two whole families of these so-called Jews. And you could tell they were Jews because they had the hat and the fringes and the whole getup. And they had literally skin much whiter than mine freckles and red hair so these people are clearly celtic they're clearly irish people but no they're 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 the chosen jews all the way back to you know abraham isaac and jacob and of course you know it's been famously said by the palestinians that the jews left israel brown and they came back white why because they are europeans even even many of them will even admit that they descend from converts to Judaism. So Juda Jewish is not a nationality. It's a religion. That's why some are brown and some are snow white to the point where they even have freckles and red hair. And we're supposed to believe these are Middle Easterners. We're supposed to believe that these are the, the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But, you know, it, it, these people just claim that they've just kept their nationality so pure. But anyway, he says, they're dispersed among all nations, yet not confounded with any. They can produce their pedigree from the beginning of the world. And that is just an outright lie. We spoke to numerous rabbis when we were making our film Marching to Zion. And not even one of them made this claim. Not even one of them said that they had a genealogy. They, they flat out told us no one has it. We asked them, does, does anyone that you know, do any of the Jews have a genealogy that even tells them what tribe they are. And the rabbi said, no, it's been lost. It's not important. We don't know. Nobody knows. Okay. None of them have a genealogy even back to close to the time of Christ, let alone back to the beginning of the world.
like this guy is claiming. That's just a complete lie. Any Anyone can research that for two minutes and figure out that that's a lie. After wars, massacres, and persecutions, they still subsist. They are still quite numerous. What but a supernatural power could have preserved them in such a manner as no other nation on earth has been preserved? Well, let me think. How about the devil? Maybe the devil has preserved a false religion like Judaism because that's what it is. It's not a nationality. It's a religion, okay? People convert to it. They convert into it. They convert out of it. It's a religion. Uh, let's see. Buddhism has been around for 2,500 years by now. You know, was that God that has preserved Buddhism for us? No, that was the devil. And we know the devil's behind Judaism because the Bible says, who is a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Messiah or Jesus is the Christ, he's Antichrist, which denieth the Father and the Son. So since the Jews deny the Father and the Son and they deny that Jesus is the Christ or that Jesus is the Messiah because Christ means Messiah, then that would mean that the Jews are Antichrist. And the Bible talks about the spirit of Antichrist being at work in, in this world. So according to the New Testament, it's the spirit of Antichrist that works in the Jews. Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, the Bible says, is not of God. This is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Read 1 John 2. There are many Antichrists, and they are those who deny that Jesus is the Christ. They deny the Father and the Son. That's the, that's the supernatural force that's behind Judaism. Antichrist, the devil. But let me keep reading here. The survival of the Jews was accomplished in the face of every obstacle, including the attempt of great powers to destroy them. Napoleon's attempt to destroy the Jews is not as well known as Hitler's, but it was perhaps even more insidious. Now keep that in mind as we continue, that he's saying that Napoleon's way of destroying the Jews was maybe even worse than what Hitler did, maybe even more insidious. Keep that in mind. Here's what he says. Napoleon wanted to destroy the Jews by assimilation. Assimilation has always been the greatest danger, humanly speaking. Now, what does he mean by assimilation? He means that they would actually stop being Jews and assimilate with other groups of people among whom they live. So basically, in a modern context, let's say a Jewish person, you know, got saved and became a Christian. Because when you're in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither bond nor free. So let's say this Jewish person got saved, became a Christian, and stopped identifying as a Jew, and they just started identifying as an American Christian, just assimilated into American culture and society. According to you know, David Cloud, that's just the most horrible thing that could happen. He's basically saying, you know, gassing the Jews is one thing, but turning them into American Christians? You know, that's even worse. Or turning them into Germans? Or turning them into French people? Oh, man. Forget that. Can you imagine if they would become Protestant? I mean, he actually is saying that it's worse to try to change these people from being Jews than to murder them. That's what David Cloud is saying. I mean, think about this. Shouldn't we as Christians want to change the Jews and want to get them to receive Christ and stop practicing this wicked religion of Judaism? and get them to assimilate and say, join a Baptist church and just assimilate right in, you know, one fold, one shepherd. But no, he was trying to assimilate them. Though some of Napoleon's actions appear to be protective and compassionate toward the Jews, the underlying motives were anything but that. Jews enjoyed much liberty under Napoleon. He liberated Jewish communities in Italy and Germany from the requirement to live in ghettos. And he made Judaism one of the official religions of France together with Catholicism and Protestantism. So basically, you just can't do enough to please these radical, crazy Zionists like David Cloud. So the fact that Napoleon liberates them from the ghettos, lets them live where they want, gives them all this unprecedented freedom, and he actually recognizes Judaism as an official recognized, protected, religious minority. That's not enough because he wanted to change the Jews, you know, because he wanted them to stop being Jews. He wanted them to convert over to Christianity and he wanted them to become French, you know, and, and assimilate into society. He's worse than Hitler.
even though he gave them all this freedom and whatever. So you you can't do it unless you just fall down and worship these people. You're called anti-Semitic. You know, you're 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 just wanting to destroy the Jews. But listen to this. His ultimate goal was assimilation, as he made plain in the following statements. So everything so far has been this article by David Cloud just falling all over himself to worship the Jews and talk about how, you know, the only reason he even believes the Bible, the biggest reason, is because of the Jews. I mean, yeah. Well, of course I believe the Bible, because the Jews. And then not only that, but he just goes on and on about how, you know, Napoleon may have even been worse than Hitler, even though he gave him all these freedoms and did all these things for him. Because of these statements that he's going to give at the end. You know, these show what Napoleon was really up to. So let me read the two damning statements at the end by Napoleon. The first one is a letter from Napoleon to Jean-Baptiste de, however you pronounce, Norpe de Champagne, Minister of the Interior. Here's what he said to this Minister of the Interior that he's giving instruction to. It is necessary to reduce, if not destroy, the tendency of Jewish people to practice a very great number of activities that are harmful to civilization and to public order in society in all the countries of the world. So what he's saying is we need to stop the Jews from doing some of the things that they do that are really harmful to society. Let me just read it for you again. It's necessary to reduce, if not destroy, the tendency of Jewish people to practice a very great number of activities that are harmful to civilization and to public order in society in all the countries of the world. It is necessary to stop the harm by preventing it. To prevent it, it is necessary to change the Jews. Now, this guy's not saying that he hates Jews or that he wants to kill them or destroy them or kick them off. He's basically saying, they have some bad tendencies and some bad practices that are destructive to society. And so we want to reduce that tendency or, or get rid of that tendency. And we're going to have to change these people. So basically, it's not that he's hating these people, but he wants to fix them. Now, obviously, you and I know what those tendencies are. One of the biggest ones has to do with usury and predatory lending practices, the banking scams and, and uh, usury and so forth that the Jews have been known for and persecuted for and hated for. Okay, so Napoleon is being very reasonable here and just saying, well, you know what, let's try to fix these people so that they won't be this way, anymore, so that they won't do these harmful things. He says this, once part of their youth will take its place in our armies, they will cease to have Jewish interests and sentiments. Their interests and sentiments will be French. So his goal is make them French people. Stop them from being a bunch of money changers and, and, and you know, scammers and, and hawkers and whatever else. Okay, so then uh, here's the next quote. That's the whole thing. Here's the next quote. This is a letter to his brother. Napoleon to his brother. Nothing could be more ridiculous than the audience you gave the Jews. I have undertaken to reform the Jews, which is consistent with his other statement. I have undertaken to reform the Jews, but I've not endeavored to draw more of them into my realm. He's saying, look, the Jews that live in France, in my realm, I'm trying to fix them. You know, I'm trying to help them become normal people, but I'm not trying to bring in more of them. Now, that makes perfect sense because they were a, a, a segment of society that was harmful. Okay. And by the way, today, today they are wicked. How can you say they're not wicked? The Bible teaches that those who don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the wrath of God abideth on them, and especially those who deny that Jesus is the Messiah. They're of Antichrist. Doesn't mean we don't love them. It doesn't mean we don't want to get them saved. But do we want them to stop being a banker? Yes. We don't want them to keep charging usury and scamming people. Why would we? But I've not endeavored to draw more of them into my realm. Far from that, I have avoided doing anything which could show any esteem for the most despicable of mankind. That's what he thinks of the Jews. He thinks that they're bad people. Now, that doesn't mean that he hates them, and he clearly is not trying to destroy them. He's clearly trying to help them be better people. You know, and here's the thing. If I come across any Jews, which I do because I go door to door, I knock every single door trying to win people to Christ, you know, you know what my goal is? My goal is to try to share with them lovingly the gospel of Jesus Christ in hopes that they will stop being a Jew. Why? Because being a Jew will take you to hell. 
because Jew is not a nationality. It is a religion. That's why some of them are brown and Middle Eastern, but most of them are white as snow. It's not a race. It's a religion. And so why would I want them to continue in a false religion of Judaism when they could be saved by the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ? Why would I want them to be in darkness when they can come to the light? And so this article is just completely bizarre. It's crazy that this is even written by a Christian. It's crazy that this is even written by, you know, someone who claims to be a Baptist. And it's so funny, whenever you go to these Zionist type websites, whether it's, you know, Chick Publications or Way of Life, it's funny that whenever you read any of their articles about Christianity, it's Jesus, this, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But then whenever they have these pro-Jew articles and pro-Israel, all of a sudden it's just God. God, God, the Lord, God, God. And they don't make mention of Jesus because it would be stupid to mention Jesus in the context of people who hate Jesus and reject Jesus, which is the Jews. So they have this cognitive dissonance where it's like they turn off the part of their brain that acknowledges Jesus. And then they're just, oh, yeah, God's protecting them. Oh, they believe in God. Look, it's not enough to believe in God. The Muslims believe in God. The problem with the Muslims is they don't believe Jesus is the son of God. And that's why they're damned. And the Jews are damned for the same reason. But anyway, this guy's just completely crazy. And then not only that, but I just want to show you a couple things. Also, just while I was looking at that, I saw another article he came out with this week because he's always pushing this false gospel, this false repent of your sins salvation. Less than a week ago, he put out this article, Careful Child Evangelism. Let me read you some excerpts from this. He says this, The church I grew up in probably didn't have even one saved young person. So he's saying, when I, the church I grew up in, none of them were saved. He says, though we all knew the right things to say, we talked the talk, but we didn't walk the walk. Now let me ask you this. Do you have to walk the walk to be saved? You know, what is that supposed to mean? I thought salvation is by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. I thought it's by grace through faith that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. But according to him, you know, in order to be saved, you got to walk the walk. Yeah, that sounds like works. Walking the walk is works. He says, we talked the talk, but we didn't walk the walk. And the reason was that we prayed a sinner's prayer and made a profession of faith. And entered the waters of baptism, but we didn't know the Lord by life-changing conversion experience. Maybe you didn't have a life-changing conversion experience because you're a kid. You know, it, it's so bizarre how, according to these people, in order to be saved, you have to have this radical life-changing conversion experience. The Bible just says you'd have to believe in Jesus. You just have to put your simple faith and trust in Christ. A childlike faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have no question that David Cloud was unsaved as a kid. And maybe the rest of his church was unsaved. I, You know, it probably wouldn't surprise me based on the corrupt fruit coming out of his ministry and the lies that he preaches about salvation. But he, the reason he wasn't saved had nothing to do with walking the walk. He clearly didn't believe the gospel. Okay, because if he had believed the gospel, he would have been saved. But he says, well, we prayed the sinner's prayer and made a profession of faith. Hey, guess what, David Cloud? All you have to do to be saved is just have faith. And if you have faith and pray the sinner's prayer, you shall be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. But no, we didn't have a life-changing conversion experience. Okay, so then he gave some steps on, you know, how to deal with children. Here's point three, deal with repentance. Though I made a profession of faith at age 10 to 11, the missing element in my life was repentance toward God. And this is what is mincing in the lives and, and hearts of many young people. I believed in Jesus, but so do the devils. Look, the Bible says that if you believe in, in Jesus, you are saved. Anyone who truly believes on the Lord Jesus Christ is saved, period, or else God's a liar. Because he clearly said in hundreds of scriptures in the New Testament that we're saved by believing and by faith. And he clearly said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. If the Bible says that whosoever believeth should not perish but have eternal life, if the Bible clearly says he that believeth on me has everlasting life, if the Bible says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, then that means that out of the 8 billion people on this earth, if there's one person 
If there's one who truly believes in Jesus who goes to hell, then that verse is a lie. Because that verse said that whosoever believeth would be saved. But he says, no, the devils believe. In fact, the devils tremble, which is far more than the average Christian young person does. I knew about Jesus and believed in him, but I did not surrender to God's authority. So he's saying that the fact that he believed in Jesus did not save him because he hadn't surrendered to God's authority. So again, it's a total works-based salvation. You have to surrender to be God's slave. You have to surrender to be God's servant in order to be saved, according to these people. That's a totally works-based. How is that a free gift? I mean, if I were going to give you a free gift and I said, hey, I've got this gift for you, but you have to be my servant for the rest of your life, then I'll give it to you. Is that really a, a free gift? If you have to if you have to make that kind of a commitment or, or do those kind of deeds? No, this is not salvation by grace through faith. He flat out says faith isn't enough. Oh, I believed in Jesus, but that's not enough because he hadn't surrendered to Christ. So basically it's lordship salvation. He hadn't made Jesus the Lord of his life. Then later on, this part just blew me away under point seven, okay? Look for the convicting, drawing work of the Holy Spirit. This is, you know, how to, how to get kids saved, according to him. Salvation is a supernatural work of God. There's no salvation apart from a convicting, enlightening, drawing work of God. The sinner must respond to the Spirit's wooing, but there is no salvation apart from the wooing. The soul winner's job is to look for the Spirit's work and help the sinner understand it and respond properly to it. Now, Jesus Christ said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. So we don't need to go around trying to figure out, I don't know, is this person being drawn? Is the wooing there? I'm not sure I can see the wooing. No, we're supposed to just preach the gospel to every creature. But he says, no, 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 we got to look for the wooing. We got to look for the conviction. Listen to the next sentence. This, this blew me away. If the child shows a persistent desire to be saved, and persistent is, is in italics, emphasized. If the child shows a persistent desire to be saved, not a mere passing interest, explain how he can be saved and let him call on the Lord in his own way. So notice, if your child just asks you how to be saved, that's not enough for you to explain them the gospel. <laughs> he flat out says, I mean, listen to this. If the child shows a persistent desire to be saved, not a mere passing interest. I mean, if your child just is, is interested in being saved and, and wants to know how to be saved, but if it's just, it, it, you know, if it only happens for a short period of time, no, 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 that's not enough. Only if the child shows a persistent desire to be saved, not a mere passing interest, explain how to be saved. Here's an idea, idiot. Why don't we just explain to everybody in the whole world how to be saved?